time I was approximately seven until I was 14, I was sexually abused in my home by my two older brothers, also another family relative and a neighbor. And I tried one time to tell someone about that abuse, to disclose the abuse, and I, ha I was a little girl. I was, you know, seven or eight years old, and I didn't have the words that could adequately convey what was being done to me. And clearly, I conveyed something because very soon after, I was raped again, and it was more violent, more aggressive. The ultimatums and the intimidation was up the notch. And what that taught me was, I will never tell another person ever again what's going on with me and what's happening to me. So that began the series of just struggle and trauma and learning to survive in the devil's playground, really. I mean, it's your home. How many rape victims have to hand their rapist a Christmas present? Hello and welcome to another exclusive interview by Recovery Today Magazine at recoverytodaymagazine.com where first and foremost we're a magazine of hope. Whether you're considering addiction recovery for yourself, a loved one, if you're actively in recovery a little while, a long, long time, you're going to find all kinds of information and topics related to addiction, sobriety, and really living a happy and successful sober life here at Recovery Today. My name is Rob Hanley. I'm the editor-in-chief of Recovery Today and as usual I'm joined by Another really, really cool guest that I'm really excited about. After I read her story, I was completely and totally blown away. She's an internationally acclaimed speaker. She's a life coach. She's the author of a compelling memoir called You Have Such a Pretty Face. She describes herself as a survivor of long-term child sex abuse in the home, which ultimately led to her addiction, uh, weight gain of up to almost 400 pounds, now she's 243 pounds lighter. She tells her story of abuse, addiction, morbid obesity, sobriety, and hope. Please welcome Kelly Gunter. Kelly, thanks for coming on. Hi. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You know, um, I, I guess kind of as I said right off the bat in the introduction, when I when we started corresponding back and forth and you sent me a link to your story and uh, who you are. We have a lot of people, a lot of great people. This is, we connect and we'll say, you know, hey, I'd like to tell my story. We're so appreciative of all of it. And unfortunately, we just can't tell everybody's story. But, it, like, your story, it blew me away. And um, we're a magazine of hope. So, you know, in the end, looking at you now and uh, and, and who you are and who you, who you seem to be, I mean, just radiate, but... Uh, um, it was a very, very stark contrast, and so we want to tell that kind of that that, that whole story of hope. So, I I set this up in, in this way, I think, for this time, particularly because we're hearing about a lot of you know stuff around abuse and things like that, and the waves of destruction that it leaves in people's lives. I, I mean, addiction is really a byproduct. And we really talk about it kind of as a disease, but in this case, kind of want to get into like it's, it's a symptom of really the the original trauma. So, you know, tell everybody our tell everybody your story a little bit and some of the things that kind of blew me away when uh, when we first started corresponding. Um, well, to start from the time I was approximately seven until I was 14, I was sexually abused in my home by my two older brothers, also another family relative and a neighbor. And I tried one time to tell someone about that abuse, to disclose the abuse, and I, I was a little girl. I was, you know, seven or eight years old, and I didn't have the words that could adequately convey what was being done to me. And clearly, I conveyed something because very soon after, I was raped again, and it was more violent, more aggressive. The ultimatums and the intimidation was up the notch. And what that taught me was, I will never tell another person ever again what's going on with me 
and what's happening to me. So that began a series of just struggle and trauma and learning to survive in the devil's playground, really. I mean, it's your home. How many rape victims have to hand their rapist a Christmas present? Wow. And that is the duality of the horror that children who are sexually abused in their own home face every day. And I think I shared with you earlier today, I said school was my reprieve. School was where I could go and be safe. And so when I would be the person watching the clock because I didn't want to go home. I was the person who would be super upset on a snow day because that meant I was home with my older teenage brothers while my parents worked. And so ultimately, I developed so many survival skills trying to just get through as a little girl. And those survival skills turned into incredibly unhealthy coping mechanisms as an adult. And um, through high school, I you know, was an athlete, I was a cheerleader, I was constantly trying to find my worth because what I knew was that I was worthless. That's how I felt. And it's incredibly difficult when you're not safe in your own home, when you can't sleep through the night and not have somebody on top of you in the middle of the night. And, but you just have to learn to endure and keep going. And so, I was so broken, I just didn't want the rest of the world to know how broken I was. And so I became this classic overachiever. I had to be the best at every single thing I did, thinking finally this will get me my worth. And I had a four point, I graduated fourth in my class. I captain of the volleyball team, you name it. Everything I did, I pushed myself to be the very, very best I could be. But none of it made any difference. Inside, I was still just as broken as I ever was. And so I went to college, and I really, really started using food as comfort then. I was away from home for the first time, and by the time I graduated from grad school, I had put on over 150 pounds. And within the next couple of years, I was at 391 pounds. So I stayed at that weight until, well, for almost two decades for 17 wow. years, yeah, and, and which only added to my feelings of worthlessness and not having any self-confidence, and of course, of course, I was the classic myth of the wounded healer. I became a therapist, and I worked with abused children, and never telling anybody, this is what happened to me. You know, I thought if I set my abuse up on this shelf and I never mention it, then I'm not a victim anymore. And what I didn't understand is that trauma, that undisclosed trauma, was controlling every single thing I did in my life. And I always say that trauma sits in the control room of our soul, and it just plays out all of the calamities of our life, and we don't realize it. And the shame of that sexual abuse, I just I couldn't tell anybody. I work with professionals who dealt with victims of sexual abuse, and I literally could not speak a word of it. And so eventually I decided I'm going to have weight loss surgery. I have to lose this weight. I was a single mom. My son was six. And so I opted to have weight loss surgery. Having the weight loss surgery, I actually died in the recovery room. I was on life support for a week. They told my parents every night, she's not going to live through the night, make her plans. And the beautiful thing there is God had a different plan. And so within 14 months, I'd lost 243 pounds. And that was actually 18 years ago. What happened in the surgery? How did you, was it bad anesthesia? Like, how did you almost die? That seems like a, I mean, they promote that kind of stuff on the radio. How, how How did you almost die? Here's a compelling, compelling piece of my story is I had what was called a compartmental syndrome, compartmentalized syndrome, and um, basically my body was suffocating itself, and eventually way down the road from my surgery when I went into treatment, and I finally disclosed my abuse, they said, 
Well, the way that you survived this, all of this horrific sexual abuse for years was you compartmentalized everything. And they didn't even know I'd ever had weight loss surgery. I hadn't shared that yet. And, but it struck me. I was like, wow, compartmentalized syndrome is what almost took my life. And, you know, we talk about the mind and the body and how, right, right. And so um, at that point, so I lost the weight, and then I had massive amounts of skin hanging everywhere, obviously. And so I became on this mission, this huge mission of get all the skin cut off, and I was constantly trying to revise my scars, and I was trying to just, trying look in the mirror and like what I saw. And finally, my plastic surgeon said to me, he said, I'm not doing any more skin removal surgeries on you. We're not revising any more scars. He said, you don't need it. You have to make peace with your body. And the thing was, I couldn't do that because it wasn't about my body. It was about everything going on inside of me. And, you know, I feel like we're like little trees. And just like little seedlings, they get all of their nutrition and their water through the roots. And then all of that is displayed in the branches of their tree. My roots were encumbered with poison and pain and trauma. And ultimately, that's what was displayed in the branches of my tree. I had more, I was so, the surgeon told me I would have probably been dead within 30 days if I didn't have the surgery when I had it. Because my body was just shutting down and suffocating itself. And so I cut off my branches of morbid obesity, but I didn't heal my roots. So I grew new branches, equally destructive, and I had a shopping addiction. And people tend to think, well, there, you can't really have a shopping addiction, but you can. I put myself into massive amounts of debt and trying to purchase my worth thinking if I wear the right clothes, if I wear the right shoes, if I have the right purse, people will know that I'm worthy. They'll see that I'm worthy. And I had a pain med addiction. I had injured my Achilles. And so I was on the pain meds far longer than I needed to be on the pain meds. And, you know, constantly calling the doctor, well, it still hurts. I don't know why. And so I, you know, I went from shopping to pain meds, and then ultimately I started gambling. And that was the addiction that you finally did, brought me. You just did all of it, gambling, oh. weight, shopping, right. opiates. <laughs> I mean, I was a busy girl. <laughs> you know, the thing was, the one thing I could never outrun was myself. So no matter how fast I ran, no matter what I tried to numb that pain with, it was never going to happen until I faced the demons that had controlled me forever. So what I really want to get to is, like, is the roots. Actually, that's kind of why I, had, I thought, you know, I really want to tell this story right now. I want to bring light to this. And as we were talking kind of, you know, this, this afternoon, we were talking a little bit about the interview. And, you know, you're saying a lot of people, they don't want to hear this. And you travel and you speak and you're an author. Um, you were going to be on a very well-known television show. I, I won't mention it. And um, they had said, you know, everything is great except for don't talk about the abuse part. And everybody that we talk to um, uh, here at Recovery Today, we're talking about the disease of addiction. We're, um, and, and, and I really bundled together. I'm not a therapist or anything like that, but just uh, I bundled together Substance abuse and non-substance abuse, I think it's just all really kind of the same thing. Depression, anxiety, I, th I think it's all kind of the same. Malady, I think is the, is, the, is the right word. And so I want to focus really kind of on the roots because it seems like we always start the story on the branches and then how the branches became really good because, you know, we got sober and that's, and that's great. But everything that I have learned is that it starts from a disconnection and trauma. You know, and so how long did this, I mean, I mean, I think you, I'm pretty aghast, you said I think seven years old is when this started. Mm -hmm. how, how long did this go on? I mean, at some point you were big enough to fend yourself off or your brothers or whomever. I mean, how, uh, how long did this go? My brothers were several years older than me. So I was the baby and they were 16, 17. So, you know, 
Um, God. It went until, right, when I was eight and nine. So when I got to junior high, that's when it stopped because they moved out. They did, left your father, did your father ever take their head off? Was there ever a reckoning for them? My dad actually died when I was nine. He had a heart attack and died. And if you remember, I tried to disclose. And when that disclosure backfired on me, I never spoke of it again. And so it's incredibly difficult for people who haven't experienced that kind of trauma to understand, they think, well, why didn't you tell? But it's, it's that shame will strangle the life and the hope that you can never have any type of normalcy in your life. And when you think about children who are sexually abused in their own homes, that I mean, sexual abuse is horrifying regardless, but my situation was in my own home. And then you have to eat breakfast with that person. You have to, like I said, get that person a Christmas present. You have to celebrate their birthday. And you can't even go to sleep at night and feel safe. You know, I always say, well, other, other kids had imaginary monsters under their bed, but mine was in my bed. So this wasn't, and, a one, this wasn't like a one-time thing. This was actually a lot. No, this was daily. Oh, God. And so just because the abuse stops, the trauma doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, MRI scans of adults who were abused as children of the brain, MRI scans of the brain of adults who were abused as children are vastly different than MRI scans of the brain of adults who weren't. And the areas that are affected are the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, which are the areas that control reason and judgment and consequential thinking, the fight or flight or freeze reflex, those things. And so those parts of you, after experiencing that kind of trauma, are impaired to some level. And so we all know people who are, oh, he's a great guy. I don't know why he cheats on his wife. I don't know why she drinks too much. I don't know why she sleeps around. Why does he, you know, always doing cocaine? Whatever it is, you know, we can all think of people that, but they're a great person. They have this issue. And people never stop to think perhaps their judgment is impaired because of unresolved issues from their childhood. And that's why we can't really sit in judgment of other people. We don't know what their reality is. We don't know what storm God has asked them to walk through. I mean, how compelling. I had a master's degree in counseling. I was a licensed professional for 27 years. And I couldn't see the forest for the trees about myself. And it took. So what is that? Is that, uh, is that like a um, everything is camouflaged in shame? Is that what it is? Where you, you are just completely unaware? Is it right. I mean, the shame has been told you. You just think, I can't tell anybody. Nobody can ever know. No one's ever going to love me if they know. And because it's compartmentalized, because you've compartmentalized it, Mm -hmm. It's not even a thought, really? Right. I mean, you grow up knowing this is part of my life. This happens to me regularly. But then there's these parts of my life that maybe aren't horrific. You know, I had my mom. I had a fabulous mom who loved me very much. I had love in my life with my grandparents. And these families, the really complex thing is it doesn't mean that your abuser doesn't love you your abuser is incredibly broken as well. And so what is the likelihood that you can ever become an adult and have a healthy functioning relationship when all you've ever known is people who love you hurt you? Is your mother alive today? She is not. Did she ever find out? No. And, you know, that's something I had to work really hard on when I went into treatment was my mom was my best friend. I love my mom very much, but my best friend and my mom failed me. How does a mom not know what's going on in her household when it's to that degree? And um, she worked very hard. She was a single mom for many years, and she was at work all the time. So that's how those things happen. But it wasn't just sexual abuse. Like my oldest brother just had an immense amount of rage inside of him. So it was a lot of violence, a lot of 
sexual abuse, a lot of rage, and just growing up in constant fear, always waiting for the unthinkable to happen. So are are you, am I off base that every, I guess I would say, I mean, trauma, I mean, you had real trauma. I think that trauma mm-hmm. also is something that it's it also, it's kind of like, um, it's a perception thing. I mean, other people could say, you know, I had a, you know, I've, we've had a lot of people on that said, you know, I had a great life, man. Like, maybe there's something that you're just thinking differently about, but what's your belief that, that there's always this root of trauma somewhere? I mean, you had an actual outside physical trauma. Do you, from your experience as a counselor, is that hold true all the time or most all the time then? That anyone who has an addiction has trauma? Yeah. Some kind I of unresolved trauma. My opinion would be that anyone who has addiction has shame about something. Yeah. 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 Um, it doesn't have to be sexual abuse. It doesn't have to be trauma. And, you know, the brain, interestingly enough, if you have a parent who is screaming at you constantly and calling you names, never hits you, the brain interprets, the brain can't differentiate between sexual abuse or physical abuse or emotional abuse or verbal abuse. It processes it all the same. And so when some people say, oh, well, I didn't go through what you've been through. At book signings, people always say to me, mine wasn't that bad. And I always say to people, don't diminish your pain because we've all lived in a house of pain. We just existed in different rooms, perhaps. You know, the first thing I've been wanting to say, actually, and then the thought keeps floating away here, um, really from the beginning and getting started in this is, uh, I mean, I probably could have put it in the intro, is I'm sorry. You know, like um, human being to human being, it, it really it breaks my heart. I'm really, really sorry that you had to endure that. Um, and as a as a um, as a as a father, uh, to um, you know, I've got a teenage girl um, and a you know now an older teenage boy, but it breaks my heart. The kind of the wreckage and the damage. I'm I'm just sorry that you had to endure that. So, how prevalent? is this though because it is even in these kind of circles as you said when we were talking before everybody wants to talk about the branches we want to talk about how they were withered and broken and they were steeped in addiction and it was destroying and causing havoc to everything your case is actually different and we you know, talk a little perception and there's trauma depending on what it is maybe your parents talked to you sternly or told you you're never going to amount to anything which is very very different than what you had gone through. So in terms of what you went through, in terms of somebody being, whether it's in the house or out, what are the statistics? How many women, how uh, boys and girls, what are the numbers? Right. Um, The APA, the American Psychological Association, published a study done by the CDC that one in three girls and one in six boys in the United States are sexually abused before they turn 18. So one, two, abused. One, two, abused. One, two, abused. Is that right? Absolutely. And with the boys, they say one in six, but many new studies are suggesting one in four. So here's what I think is so uh, uh, insidious about, about this whole thing is it's been my observation that it's um, the abusers – become, um, the abusers were abused. <laughs> Their victims become abusers um, as well. And a lot of this stuff is just generate, it's just generational. It's like a, it's like a real virus. I mean, a true kind of a virus. I mean, um, of, of inflicting trauma one, you know, one to the next person. <laughs> um, and I know that although it's unsavory to talk about, it's not Christmas party conversation, of course, but you would think actually in, a, in an environment like ours, where or in a meeting or something like that, that it would be something that you really, um, uh, you know, the meeting's a little bit different. You can talk about anything, but that people would be more open to hear. I, I see it almost as kind of like what sobriety and addiction might have been, you know, years ago. People will send us letters and say, you know, what about an anonymity and things like that. And that, I think, goes back to a tradition of, like, you just couldn't speak of these things, that you're somebody that you loved or that you yourself were struggling with addiction. Um, right. You know, why, what caused you, what was the turning point to have you come out? Were you, I mean, you were aware of this. When did you have this aha moment, like, that's it? 
when I was handcuffed by the police in my neighborhood and bent over the hood of my car. So, but still, here's how powerful that shame is. I ran a business that I had founded, and with my gambling addiction, I misused money from that business. So I was arrested and eventually convicted of theft for that. And But at that point, when I was arrested, the board of directors for my company um, wanted me, they said, you have to get into treatment. We have to figure out what's going on with you. And I remember that one of the members of the board, the night before I left, they found a treatment place they wanted me to go to in Sedona, Arizona. And um, she told me, she said, I don't know what's going on with you. She said, but whatever it is, just tell them the truth. Just be honest with them. And so I arrived, as I was sitting on the airplane, actually, waiting to take off, I thought... Just so I have the chronology of where you are in the timeline mm -hmm. here. The business, so you're out of college, and so there's abuse, there's all this super achievement, 4.0, cheerleader, all of this stuff like that, college, master's degree, then there's weight gain from the trauma, right? And mm -hmm. then you're a counselor... I mean, it's really, now you look at the landscape, you can kind of see all of it. When did this business start? This is kind of like after kind of being a counselor or in the process? Right. When then? Right, okay. I started the business in 2003. So I ran the business for 13 years. I didn't start gambling until 2015. And in 2016 is when everything just collapsed around me. And, um, you know, an incredibly You're the classic counselor that ha that's going to go to treatment, right? Then, right. You've never, really, you've never been to treatment, is that? Is no. that right? Wow. Right. And so, as I sat on the plane, I, you know, was thinking of her words, and I thought, I'll tell them everything about the gambling, but I'm not telling them that. I mean, I had nothing to lose. <laughs> what was left to lose? I lost the business that I founded, and had ran very successfully for a long time. I lost my home, I lost my cars, I lost all of our belongings, I lost every friend I had except one, it was just my son and I, lost my family, everything. And so, what was left to lose? But I still wasn't going to tell it. And in fact, the people at the center where I went said, you know, when you came in, we thought we have our hands full with this one. Like She knows what we're looking for, and they suspected what my issues were. But I still, it took them almost a week, almost a week of me being there before finally. So they knew immediately. They, they, they probably statistically one, two, three abuse, one, two, three abuse, right? They knew statistically, no, there's this right. is probably what happened. So they're trying to crack that nut and, and break that open, and you just wouldn't give it up. Right. And, I mean, they looked at my whole life. I'd always dated men who were emotionally unavailable, men who I had to chase after, and, you know, I always say if dating the wrong men were an Olympic event, I'd be a gold medalist. <laughs> I mean, I constantly picked people who just were unavailable to me, and, you know, I had to chase and chase and chase and chase until I could get them because I thought that would prove my worth. Yeah. And then once, the really funny thing was, people thought, oh, Kelly's just about to chase. Like, once she gets them, she doesn't want them anymore. That was true, but it wasn't about the chase. Because once they wanted me, I thought, what's wrong with you that you would want me? There must really be something wrong with you. So it wouldn't be very long until I'd be next. And so once I finally disclosed that trauma, then that's when my healing journey began. And I think I shared with you earlier that it was like a portal opened up in my life. And all of the years of repressed trauma I mean, I had flashbacks just flooding me, intrusive thoughts, nightmares. It really was the darkest two years of my life. And at the same time, I had my court issue. And, you know, part of recovery is standing up and taking responsibility for your mistakes and the mistakes you make in the blur of addiction. And that was really, really difficult and hard. And But it was part of my journey. And so... All of that's going on at the same time. I'm trying, that's when I started to write my book. And 
my book, of course, the title is because people would say to me when I was bigger, they would always say to me, oh, it's such a shame, Kelly. You have such a pretty face. Pretty face. You know, as if because I wasn't packaged in a body they found attractive, what exactly was the shame? My whole life is a shame because you don't find me physically appealing. And so I always said, one day I'm going to write a book and the title's going to be you. Oh, I like that. And, but really the, like that. Yeah, the book is, it does detail my weight loss, but the book is actually about my trauma and about the fact that losing weight wasn't the magic eraser that I thought it was going to be for all of my life's problems. What does your intuition tell you percentage-wise? Because we're talking about one in three of just mm -hmm. all women and one in four to one in six of boys. But since, since you're a lady, we'll stay there. So for women that have struggled maybe with uh, obesity, I don't want to just say weight gain because you know it's the whole uh, ideal of perfection and things like that, but obesity, let's just say, right. and, and things like that. What would the, what's the percentage that you would intuitively just guess in terms of had a story similar to yours? The numbers are staggering. And I don't have the exact figure for you, but I was at a retreat with a friend of mine, Dr. Connie Stapleton, and she's an addiction expert in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was at her home for a retreat, and she gave a statistic, something like people who've had weight loss surgery over, I think it was 67% of them have been sexually abused. Yeah. Okay. It's really, really, um, people use food as comfort. People, yeah. you know, there's a lot of different psychological um theories for why people do it. It could be, oh, if I'm really big, then it's a wall against the rest of the world that no one can hurt me or get to me. I mean, everybody has a different um, reason for what's happening. So I, don't off, I don't want to let off the topic of the root. That's really the main kind of thing. And first of all, I'm really glad that you have um, got it out, made peace with it, and that you're um, healthy and um, um, on this path to really authentically be able to help a lot more people, probably than you ever could as a counselor. I mean, I, I think it's really, I think it's really great. One of the things that struck me that I was going to ask you about, though, is I saw a post that you had on Instagram. There's a video, and you were talking about how some of the feedback that you have got um, for sharing this story of abuse. Mm -hmm. And why do you have to? And why can't you? Can you talk a little bit about that? Right. People who had known my family and known me. I don't me. want to let up. I want to amplify what it is that you're saying. Right. Because they said, oh, you should have taken this to your grave with you. Why would you do this? Like, this is something that should stay in closed doors. That's the problem. That's the entire problem. That's living in shame. That's living in silence. And silence is the comrade of shame. And as long as we're silent... Silence is the comrade of shame. Silence is the com... Okay. Yep. And as long as we feel like we have to be quiet, as long as we feel that we can't tell our truth, then how can we ever heal? You can't heal what you don't acknowledge. It's impossible. And that's why I do tell my story. There was just a point when I was just in such a dark place and I was searching everywhere for inspiration on YouTube and the internet and I found all kinds of motivational videos of people who had survived things but no one who had survived things and some of their hurdles were because of their own mistakes because of unhealed trauma and I never had any intention of becoming a speaker. I mean, I kept this secret for 40 years of my life. And, but on that day, I just promised God, I said, I will do it. I'll tell it all. So I don't forget this one as well. Talk to me about how, the, how bad it actually got in terms of suicide. Now, I know that you're writing another book. There's a couple of things <laughs> that said, don't ask me this because it's going to be the next. So sorry if I'm kind of, you know, the cat out of the bag, but I haven't heard that one before, so I'm <laughs> sorry. Oh, you are calling me out. Okay, well, my next memoir that I... didn't do it on purpose. I, I figured it probably was going to be in the next thing, but what you told me, I was like, wow, I haven't, I haven't heard that one before. Well, no one has heard it before, but since you're calling me out, I guess here's the um, 
special edition recovery today issue. Um, so my current memoir that I'm finishing is The Homecoming Queen of Crazy Town. And it's stories of, I say that we all have a queen or a king inside of us. Mm -hmm. And when we're hurting, when we're irrational, when we're overwhelmed, that's who likes to take over and be in charge of our life. So if you've ever had a day where you say, if one more person says one thing to me, I'm going to let them know. Like, that would be your homecoming king of crazy town taking over. So I introduced that persona in You Have Such a Pretty Face. So this next book is all stories of my life prior to healing and all the crazy, inappropriate, sometimes pathetic, usually hilarious, though, stories of my life, sometimes heartbreaking, are in there. And at one point... I just was in such despair dealing with all of the trauma and the resurfacing um, memories and flashbacks and intrusive thoughts and nightmares. And it was one thing after another, after another, after another. And at the same time, I was dealing with my court issues. I was, you know, I lost my home. I didn't, I had no friends. I mean, it was just overwhelming. And I thought, my son is going to, like, this is terrible for him. And I just wanted to make sure I took care of my son. So I wanted him to have my life insurance. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to take my own life. And I also knew that my life insurance probably wouldn't cover suicide. So I, through going online and talking to people who knew people who knew people who knew people, I actually got a meeting with a person who... Um, a hitman. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so I was, you know, his exact words to me were, who pissed you off and what do you want me to do about it? And so... so you know, literally, like, people a lot will say, oh, yeah, you know, the depths of my despair and things are so bad, you know, I had suicidal ideation, I thought about killing myself all the time. Once in a while, it would be like I tried, but you are the first that I've ever heard of. And, and maybe people have the idea, like, you know, I, I've had the idea before, like on a, in, in bad times, or, you know, the, I'm flying on a plane, like I would say to myself, if the plane actually crashed, I really wouldn't care. Like, right. you know, right. it would be over, nobody would know. Honest to God, I would, I'd really, I'm not even remotely afraid if it just hit the ground. But actually thinking like I'm going to hide and then going through and actually having a conversation with somebody. Right. In a seedy little bar several hours from my home and um, walking into the place, you know, I don't want to give up too much of the story, but I thought, good God, like, if somebody's going to kill me in this place, certainly, you know, right. and, um, but, so that story goes from there. I don't know if you want me to tell uh, the rest. You don't got to give it up any more than that. That's more than enough to think about, like, hey, I didn't just think about committing suicide. I actually was going to hire a hitman to right. do it, and then uh, he told you that you're out of your mind or something like that. I think it's what you're, I don't know what it was, but. Yeah, honestly, if he, like, the heartbreaking thing is he valued my life more than I did. At the time. That's pretty crazy. When you find a hitman that values your life more than you. So, okay, as we start coming in for landing here, and I, I, I so appreciated actually talking to today, talking with you today. I, I loved reading your story, although, you know, it really hurt my soul. And um, so much of what uh, kind of prompted me to do this is, is I'm seeing a lot of stuff about, you know, sex trafficking and, and pedophilia and children and, and um, slavery, stuff like that. Um, that you know, people and people always think it's over there. You know, it's like it's it's it, it's in some distant, faraway land, and it's, it's here. It's actually here, you know, in, in in the United States as well. And so I, I thought, you know, this is a, I want to I want to talk about this. I want people to know the the damage that this causes. But now, kind of transitioning in the story to an uptick of hope. Like, what has happened since? Because it's one thing to go, hey, she got, it almost looks like, hey, she got sober, and then she lost weight, and she's in the gym, and she's fit, like, all the stories that we hear, which are great, but that's not, like, you got, that was still, you're still in your, you didn't even start at everything when you did the weight loss surgery, so, kind of, what, what's happened since? 
what is the what's kind of the uptick of hope and what do you hope what do you want to do? You know, right. what's your purpose? Well, my purpose is to just spread light everywhere so that the people who still feel trapped in that darkness know that if I can heal, they can heal. Every one of us is worthy and every victim deserved better and you aren't your mistakes. You are far more than anything that anybody ever did to you and we can heal. I say in my, and you have such a pretty face that hope stands for hold on, pain ends. And, and it does. Love that. Love that. I mean, hold on, pain ends. Love that. Yeah, I, if your heart is still beating, then God's not done with you yet. Mm-hmm. You know, and you, if you survived the event that hurt you, then you can survive the healing too. A lot of people are really hesitant to begin the healing process because it does reopen wounds and it's painful. But there, I, like, here's pain <laughs> and here's peace. And the bridge that connects them is healing. And you just have to walk across that bridge, you know, and embrace your healing. So what information was it counseling once you opened this Pandora's box and you came clean, okay? I talk about Pandora's box in the book. So I know, so I know that once the floodgates opened up and all of this came out, that you've been holding all back all of your mm-hmm. life. So... How did you reconcile that? Was it through massive psycho counseling? Was it from books that you read? Like, if somebody's going through this, like, obviously, talk to a friend, talk to, you know, or has gone through this, maybe. Obviously, if you're hearing abuse, like, call a cop or something like that. But if you're dealing with the wreckage of this, obviously, get it out. But then how did you build this bridge to peace? I mean, faith? Was it books? Was it videos? Was it conversation? Like, what was the... You know, and then the reluctant hero rose up, et cetera, et cetera. How, how did that part happen? Um, well, first, let me just say that I talk about Pandora's box, and you have such a pretty face. And I don't know if you know that the last thing out of Pandora's box, do you know what it was? No. It was hope. So, yeah, um, you know, Zeus was mad at the humans, and so he put all the evils in that box, and he told Pandora, You'll be happy as long as you never open the box. So she opens the box. All the evil, yeah, all the evils fly out, and you know, hate, envy, greed, all the sin in the world, all the hurtful things, and all the evil, and they're biting her and stinging her all over the place. Then her husband comes in and you know shuts the box, but then they hear this little voice crying, wanting to be let out of the box, and they figure, well, it can't get any worse, and they open it, and there was hope, Mm. kind of cowered in the corner, and fluttered out and like get on, got onto all of her sores where the other bugs had stung her. And so Zeus had a little bit of pity. So people always say, oh, you're going to open Pandora's box. Yeah, but the last thing out of Pandora's box was hope. I never knew that. Yeah, and so I love that. But to answer your question, um, first and foremost, of course, God in my faith is what really saved my life and saved everything. I always had faith, but it was very peripheral faith. Like, oh, I pray, and, you know, I love God. and But I never really had to rely on that because I had nothing else. And so God led me to the people who had the expertise to... So you had some kind of get-on-your-knees type experience then? I, I did. I um, But... Like I said, I always had faith, but it just wasn't that, um, you know, because many times I was like, where is God? You know, where was God? What kind of God let the child be raped over and over? You know, of course I had those questions. And in my book, I had an angel experience, which I won't go into here, but I would always remember, okay, well, if the angels exist, and I know they do, because my son and I both experienced them and saw them. So... If angels exist, then that just means God's ignoring me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's good and evil. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then my son said to me, I was outside sitting on a step crying one day in the middle of all this, and I said, where is God? And he said, you know, Mom, did you ever think that God is outside the front door fighting monsters that you don't even know were after you? And 
wow. kind of clicked for me. And so, but God led me to the right people who could help me. And then I had to do the work. I had to be willing to really try to change. It's very difficult to learn all new coping mechanisms in your life to stop it every time, literally. And I just spoke to someone about this today. Literally, probably 50 times a day, I would have to stop and say, how do I want to handle this? Do I want to use my old coping mechanisms that were created of fear of rejection and et cetera, et cetera? Or do I want to be vulnerable? Do I want to heal? Do I want to? So it took a massive effort. And, you know, healing isn't linear. There were but back and forth and back and forth. And ultimately, um, with a lot of counseling, a lot of faith, a lot of practice, a lot of determination, I was able to get to a place of peace. And I promise, happiness is just on the other side of suffering. Is that yeah. the message that you would say to somebody? I mean, you kind of answered a question I didn't ask. Is that the message that you would say to somebody that's going sh you know, this happened to me. Like, that happened to me. Like, your story is my story. Right. Whatever, whatever age they are, maybe they're in their teens, maybe they're in their early 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and they're thinking, I never, is that, is that your message to them? What is it your message to them? Absolutely. I would say that not everybody wants to tell the whole world. I mean, I didn't want to tell the whole world, but this is how I evolved. And, but your story matters, and your pain matters. And you matter. And, you know, I was at a big weight loss conference once, and they said, oh, you know, they wanted me to do all this stuff. And I said, you know, I'm not the weight loss surgery poster girl. And they said, well, if you're not the way, if you're not that, what are you? And I said, I like to say I'm the hope girl. Wow. You know, that in the darkest moments, cling to your hope because, I'm over here shining my light like crazy, just trying to reach everybody and telling them you're worthy. You're worthy and you can heal. And so now you, um, you're obviously you're a counselor. You've been a counselor. You're still, but you're obviously qualified because one of the things that I think about is we go through things that we go through, bad things, people dying, addiction, sobriety, whatever it might be. We go through bad things because I think the purpose of life is to give confidence to other people. And you can't give confidence to somebody. They don't, they're not going to receive it. They're not going to buy into it. If you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth or everything with sunshine and rainbows, you have to be able to connect with them and to say, your story is my story. I'm just further down the road. And if you do A, B, C, and D, then, I mean, so there's a qualification that you have that your message is unique, you can connect with unfortunately the masses millions of people that have struggled and dealt with what you're going through do you how do people connect with you do you help people in, the, in that kind of context like you know what's part of what you do now um, right now I just write and I'm a speaker and um, I do have a group called binge free babes that I partner with dr. Nina of LA talk radio and that's for people with emotional eating issues and um, that's just bingefreebabes.com. But for me, I write and I speak and I continue to let people know that they can heal and that their voice matters. And no matter what you've been through, no matter what was done to you, you're still a child of God. And you deserve to be happy simply because your heart is beating. And, you know, I will fight for you. I mean, I fight for survivors every single day. And I stand by you. I, you know, I say you're walking down this path and it seems like you can't make it one more step. But what you're going to see on that path is my footprints. Mm. And if I could keep going and I could make it, I know my survival was intentional. And so... That's where I am. I'm just, I'm going to continue to tell my story. I'm going to continue to write. Um, I literally get hundreds of messages on social media from people, men, women, just sharing their truth. So and what is your website and your social media? My Instagram is at Gunter Kelly. And um, you at G-U-N-T-E-R-K-E-L-L. -L 
Y or E Y. K E L L Y. G U N T E R K E L L Y. K E L L E Y. Sorry, K E L L E Y. Okay. We'll make sure we put it in the piece and all the stuff like that. We'll do it correctly. And what is, what's your what's your website? My website, I mean you can do any you can do the title of my book, you have such a pretty face dot com. You can do my name, Kellygunner.com. You can even do Homecoming Queen of Crazy Town, even though it's not out. Um, dot com. All of those go to the same place. Okay. And then my Facebook is Kelly Gunter, and I also have an author page. We're going to put all of that in here. So the book is You Have Such a Pretty Face, your social, at Gunter Kelly, K-E-L-L-E-Y, and uh, the website, kellygunter.com. And I would say for anybody that's out there, if this is you, then we did this interview today for you. So if this is you and you're thinking, God, I carried this around or this that or I've never shared or whatever, then you're talking to somebody that's actually qualified. Oh, I mean, obviously, I have to on help Facebook, I have a group called the Trauma Tribe, and yeah. that's um, a group for survivors of trauma, and there's just a lot of support in there. And um, I'm also an admin in a group called Victims of Violent Crime. And so, you know, there's just healing everywhere. You don't have to tell everybody, but tell someone. Even if you're just part of a group, there's so many people in Trauma Tribe who never post, who don't comment, but they read, and they get a lot of support and healing just from reading other people's posts. Yeah, you don't gotta, you don't gotta be an author or a speaker, you just probably gotta get it out and process it, and it's, I think right. there's one thing about, like, you're not alone. Unfortunately, right. you're not alone, and it's a lot of people and I think that when you deal with these things and you get these things out, a lot of things in life come into focus about, oh, that's why I did that. That's why this right. happened. Everything starts to kind of make sense when, uh, you know, it, it's all about light at light in the darkness type of stuff. So I'm really gl gr glad and grateful that you uh, took some time to connect today and to have this, you know, pretty heavy, uh, it's not a Christmas party kind of conversation, but I like the uptick of hope of it. Um, I just think you're super, super cool, and um, we're really happy that we could tell your story. And, again, I would just say I'm really sorry that this happened for you, but I'm a big believer that, you know, everything that was meant kind of for evil gets turned around and, and used in a good and purposeful and mighty kind of way. So um, I just thank you for, for, you know, for jumping on and, and spending time here today. Well, thank you. I just, I guess I'll close by saying and I honestly mean this with every piece of my being. If I help one person and one person doesn't feel so alone and one person has hope, then every single thing I went through is worth it. Yeah. You know, I know what it feels like to be in so much pain you just don't want to see the next minute. And so if I can alleviate even a piece of that for someone, I just feel like that's my purpose. That's why I'm here. Yep. I love it. Well, thank you so much. I feel, the, I feel the same way here at Recovery Today. So thank you so much. Thank you for everything you guys do. It's amazing. Absolutely. If you hang on for just one second, I'll stop the recording. This has been another okay. exclusive interview by Recovery Today Magazine, recoverytodaymagazine.com. Hang on one sec.